The Lord has blessed us with a beautiful day to be able to come together here in Cookville to worship Him. And I look out and I see a good crowd this evening. It seems like the same numbers, if not even more. And that's very encouraging for a Sunday evening. So I'm very grateful for your presence and again thankful to the congregation for the invitation to be with you in these series of lessons. If you'll keep your Bible open to the scripture reading that we had earlier there in Proverbs chapter 4, we're going to begin there this evening in Proverbs chapter 4. But thank you for being here and I hope that our lessons from God's Word are beneficial and helpful. I wanted to thank the brethren for the, the hospitality this afternoon that Sherry and I received in the potluck. I really appreciate the, uh, the good food and especially I know the ladies do a lot of work in that. So thank you and the, the men in setting up and tearing down and different things that you have to do. And I really appreciate uh, your kindness and love and hospitality toward us. And I even have a special gift that I got from Eliana. Is Eliana here? Where's Eliana? I like your picture, Eliana. <laughs> She's being shy now. So that's great. Good to have that special gift today from the children. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 is a very well-known passage. Guard your heart or keep your heart, depending upon the version that you have. And so the question I ask this evening is, how well are we guarding our heart? How well are we protecting our heart? And the reason we want to raise this question this evening is, we're going to look at a second very fundamental lesson. The first one this morning is that God makes our mind and He wants to help us with our mind through His Word and through answering prayers and through His providential care for us. He wants to help us with our mind. A second fundamental lesson that we want to build upon this evening is very simple. What comes in goes out. What comes into our heart and in our mind is what's going to go out in actions. So it's a second very fundamental lesson. If I find myself in my actions, in my thoughts and feelings and actions, not being what I need to be, then I need to look at a couple of things. I need to look at what's coming into my heart. And number two, I need to look at how I'm reacting to what's coming into my heart. So what comes in is going to go out. What comes in in information, what I see with my eyes, what I hear with my ears is going to go out in action. We have the expression, you are what you eat, right? So if every day we just constantly put in junk food, if I just eat Twinkies all day long, do, you, do they still make Twinkies? I don't know. If they do, they, that should be banned. Uh, <laughs> it's terrible. Um, but if I just put junk food in my body every day, it's going to bring my body down. In, in a sense, I am what I, what I eat. So if I'm eating healthy, I'm going to feel healthy. My body's going to be healthy. If I'm eating junk food after a while, that's going to cause problems in my body. You are what you eat. But the biblical principle of the way the, the Bible says that is, you are what you think. And that's what we're talking about this evening. You, you really are what you think. The type of information that goes into our heart affects our actions. Thinking, good or bad, leads to actions, good or bad. Thoughts cause feelings and emotions, and feelings and emotions cause actions. And this is a truism that is even recognized by non-believers and unbelievers. Non-believers and unbelievers in the counseling world will tell you that you act the way you're thinking. It's a truism that's even accepted by people in the world. And it's because it comes from God's Word. 
And emotions, good or bad, can even affect our body. We have what's called psychosomatic. Often the way we're thinking can even cause illness in our body. We can be stressed in our mind and it can cause an ulcer in the stomach. The mind and body are, are intricately intertwined. It was Shakespeare who wrote in the play Richard III, the eyes are the window of the soul. A lot of times you can look at a person's eyes or even facial expression and you can tell what's going on in their heart often. They're both connected. The thoughts that we have, whether real or imagined, they lead to conduct. And so this evening, we want to then look at this principle. If that's the case, and it is, then we want to guard our heart. We want to keep it and guard it and protect it from the information that is coming in so that it does not go out in some sort of action or behavior that, that God is not pleased with. Our mind is like a calculator or a computer or a, or a cell phone, a smartphone. What you enter in, the data that you enter in, that's what you're going to get out. Input, output. You take a calculator or your cell phone and flip over to the, the calculator app. You hit two and then the plus sign and you hit two again and then the equal sign, you're going to get four. Because of what you put in, that's what you're going to get out. It's the same thing with our mind. And so we want to then guard our mind. Much of what is going on with the problems, the mental problems or the health problems or the actions that are going on today has to do with what's entering into the mind. And even, even people in the world recognize this, especially with the school shootings, for example, like there was one in Nashville not too long ago, even people in the world recognize that often the individuals that are doing terrible things, they've been thinking terrible things. They've been allowing terrible things to come into their mind. And even people in the world recognize that. So what we want to do this evening is we want to talk about learning how to guard our hearts and our minds. This is an Old Testament principle. Let's look at a few examples. First of all, in Proverbs chapter 4, not only do we have the statement, guard or keep your heart, but the context going all the way back to chapter 4 and verse 1 deals with God's Word. Go all the way back to chapter 4 and verse 1 and you'll be reading about the importance of the instruction from God's Word. Wisdom, God's wisdom from verse 5. Verse 10, uh, the sayings and what is taught. These are things that are coming from God's Word. In verse 15, stay away from the path of the wicked. So even before we get to verse 20 in the immediate context, Verses 1 through 19 is talking about the importance of having God's Word in our life. And that's what our lesson was this morning. And then we get to verse 20. My son, attend unto my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. What words? What sayings? That which ultimately comes from God. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health. We talk about mental health. How do we have life and health? We let God's word into our life. And then verse 23, keep thy heart with all diligence, guard thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Underscore that in your Bible. That's a biblical principle. What's coming into your heart, that's what's leading in the issues, the actions of life. And then notice in the immediate context that the proverb writer also talks about the mouth and the lips and the eyes and the eyelids and the feet and the ways and the foot. If you're taking notes, I want you to take note of the different parts of the body that are controlled by the heart. What I look at, what I listen to, eyes, okay? 
feet, ways, foot, where I'm going, what I'm listening to. The heart is controlling all of these things in my life. And so verse 23 is fundamental. The heart must be guarded because out of that is coming action. And even where I'm going and what I'm looking at and what I'm saying with my mouth. It's just a fundamental principle, input, output. And so that's what we want to talk about. What is our input? That's what we're going to focus on tonight. The broader context is being guided by God's word. Look at another example in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 with regard to the flood. And Jehovah saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Wickedness is action. But where did that come from? The imagination of the thought of his heart was evil. Do you see the two connections there? Wickedness in red, that's action. In the blue is the stuff that's coming from the heart. One leads to the other. Turn with me to Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9, a very familiar passage. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Well, in the red, the wicked, his way, that's action. What is that coming from? The unrighteous man's thoughts. So when people come to us, young or old, and they're having actions in their life that aren't good, and sometimes even physical things going on in their body that aren't good, we need to ask ourselves, well, that's coming from their mind and their heart, but what's, what are they feeding their mind? What are they feeding their heart? Or how are they reacting to what is going on around them? Again, notice in the rest of the passage the idea of thoughts and ways. There's a connection here. And our thoughts and ways need to match up with God's thoughts and ways. Turn with me to the New Testament. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. We're going to see a few passages in the New Testament where this principle is found as well. First of all, in Matthew chapter 12, when Jesus is uh, rebuking the Pharisees, they didn't like that he had healed on the Sabbath day. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You underscore that in your Bible. Out of the abundance of the heart... The mouth speaks. Mouth speaking, that's action. Where did it come from? The heart. They had, I'm sorry, I mentioned earlier about uh, the, the matter of the, um, yes, the, the matter of uh, casting out the demon in Ma uh, Matthew chapter 12. In the parallel account, uh, turn with me to Mark chapter 7, this is where uh, they were saying to Jesus, you have to wash your hands before you eat. And Jesus said, it's not what goes into the body that defiles you, but what comes out of the body. And in Mark chapter 7, look at this. Out of the heart of men, evil thoughts proceed. And in the red, in the red, that's all actions. Where do those actions come from? Fornication, which is sexual immorality. Theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, railing, pride, and foolishness. Where does that come from? Jesus said, out of the heart of men. Input output. And we could take time this evening to go down through each one of those actions. If someone's committing fornication, we could talk about what's in their heart that's leading to that. If somebody is stealing or murdering or committing adultery, we can back that process up and we can find out what are they feeding their mind and then it's coming out in this, these actions. Parents of young people, we've got great young people here this evening. Sometimes as parents, we're working with our young people and they're struggling with things in their mind and so forth. As parents, we have to ask ourselves, what are my children, what, what information is being fed them? This is a basic principle that's found in the Word of God. In Isaiah chapter 55, I'm sorry, this should be... Um, this should actually be Ephesians chapter 4, if I put the wrong verse there. Ephesians chapter 4. That you no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. That's action. In the vanity of their mind, they were darkened in their understanding. They were ignorant. They were hardened in their heart. They were past feeling. What did they give themselves up to? Lasciviousness. That's actions. What led to the lasciviousness? All of these things in blue. The vanity of their mind and darkened and ignorant and hardened. What's in your heart and mind? Ephesians 4, 17 through 19, if you're looking that up. 
What's in your heart and mind comes out in bodily actions. James chapter 4. This is talking about brethren in the local church fighting. Whence come wars and fightings? That's action. That's, that's bad action. Where's it coming from? Pleasures that war in your members. Lust, which is in your heart and in your mind. When you read kill, covet, fight, war, those are actions. Where is that coming from? Pleasures that war in your members and lust. So what was in their heart is leading to this fighting and war among the brethren. So this evening, we need to guard our hearts. And that's what we want to spend the rest of our time talking about this evening. Turn with me to Luke chapter 8 and verse 35. You are what you think. Turn with me to Luke chapter 8 and verse 35. So the first thing we need to do with regard to guarding our heart is we need to remove anything that is negative or worldly or evil or sinful. Do you remember when Jesus cast out the gathering demon act in Luke chapter 8 and verse 35? They came and they found him, and the text says that he was sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. What had Jesus done? He had removed this demonic force out of this man. He was sitting before the text says he was in the tombs. He was yelling and carrying on. People tried to put chains on him and he broke the chains. The text says that nobody would pass by. This man was violent. He was aggressive. People stayed away from him, but he's sitting calm, clothed. Before that, he would not have any clothes on. He would rip his clothes off. And in his right mind, the text says, what did Jesus do for this man? He got the evil out of him. Now, we don't have demon possession today. I don't have time to establish that point. But because of the prophecy in Zechariah 14 that one day the unclean spirit would pass out of the land and the fact that we don't have the miraculous today to help with that. We don't have demon possession today, so I'm not bringing up this passage to try to make that parallel. My point is that when evil is in us, not demon possession, but when evil or worldliness or sin is in us, we got to get that out of us, and when we get that out of us, we can be sitting clothed and in our right mind, if you will. There has thinking from the world that has gotten into our mind that is causing the problem. It's not coming from God. It's not coming from God's Word. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. God is not going to give you anything that is negative or wrong or sinful. It's coming from somewhere else. It's not coming from God. It's not coming from the Scripture. And if that is in our life, we've got to get that out of our life. So, we've got to ask ourselves then... What is it that's coming in from the world that we've got to get out? Now, in the old days, it was, you know, watching TV and music and the radio and things like that. Now it's the smartphone. But there, there are things, there are forces in the world, and it could be human beings. It could be friends. It could be people we're around at work or school, movies, music, stuff on our phone. And those things are feeding our mind with evil, worldliness, sinfulness, and it's coming out in actions. And it could be subtle actions. It could be subtle actions that aren't right according to God's Word. So a lot of times we're in a world where information can be coming from worldly non-Christian sources and can damage our mind and our thinking. Now, let's talk a little bit about social media. Just this afternoon, uh, Sherry was showing me some f uh, Facebook posts for Father's Day and some friends and family that we know, and it, it really is great to be able to, to read some of that and keep up with friends and family. So again, with regard to a caveat, <laughs> not all of it's bad. A lot of it is being used for good. We're just simply keeping up with friends and family. A good friend of mine, good preacher friend of mine in, in Florida was 
talking about his 35th anniversary today and how happy he was about that. It was good to see that post. Um, There are some Christians, including young Christians. Uh, We have a young Christian that was with us for many years at Warfield Boulevard. He uses Facebook and other outlets like that to advertise gospel meetings, to invite his friends to singings. Uh, It's being used to advertise good things like that. What I'm about to talk about would be the negative. I'm talking about getting information that is worldly or ungodly. Obviously, if we're using social media in a good way, in a wholesome or clean way, obviously there's no problem with that. But often with our young people, that's not what's going on. We have to be realistic about what's going on. It's not just a simple Facebook post about grandma. If that's all it was, that would be fine. What we're talking about is Instagram posts or TikTok videos and things like that that have ungodly conversations, behavior, dress, and so forth in it. That's what we're talking about. And we need to be realistic. That's the kind of thing when I say this evening, when I say limit your social media use, that's what I mean by that. Not the obvious good use of that. Young people, let me say something about your parents and the, and the phone. Sherry and I went through this with our four children. Our youngest is 20, our oldest is 33. And we went through these things with our children. Young people, listen. With regard to the phone, which, you know, the, the elephant in the room, that, that's the big, the big thing. When your parents talk with you about that, whether or not you're going to have one or not, at what age you have one or not, how you use it or not, what you use it for or not, you need to understand that your parents love you and care for you, and they're just simply trying to do what we're talking about tonight. They're trying to help you guard your heart. And when they place limitations or they have rules or they have these guidelines, understand that's where they're coming from. They're not trying to be mean. They're not trying to ruin your life. They're not trying to... Let's... Parents don't get up, the parents here at least, they don't get up in the morning, let's see how we can make our children's lives miserable today. They're they're not doing that. When they have these things involving the phone, just understand that they're trying to help you to guard your heart. They want you to go to heaven with them. They don't want you to be taken in by the devil in the world. And they know that the phone and other kinds of things can have those hurtful things that go along with that, and they're, they're trying to keep you from that. They're trying to help you guard your heart. But it's not just that. It could be an adult watching news programs, sitcoms, binge watching, and other kinds of things. We can get so engrossed in the things of the world that we don't realize that it's slowly feeding our mind. We might even end up talking like the person that we listen to a lot or acting like them. And in the old days, we talked about things like, well, uh, cussing and profanity and sexual immorality and uh, lewdness and pornographic kinds of things. All of those things are wrong. But I can be picking up just subtle and insidious types of things, young people, with regard to social media. And this is what I mean with regard to things like Instagram and TikTok. It's not that I'm picking up a bad word and then all of a sudden I start saying that bad word. It's it's more subtle than that. It's things like uh, I'm starting to pick up this bad attitude of rebellion toward my parents or I'm talking back more or... I don't want to do my work at school or if I have a summer job or um, I don't value someone or I'm, I'm gossiping or putting someone down or making fun of something. It's, it's smaller things like that. Along with just the straight up bad words or other kinds of things. We really need to limit that and This is not just coming from me. Last month, 
the Surgeon General, who is by no means a member of the church, <laughs> the Surgeon General, and I've got it with me, I can provide a copy for you, wrote a Surgeon General's report, about 25 pages. In fact, Jason, if you'll remind me, I'd like to get that to you if you can make a copy. In the Surgeon General report on mental illness among teens and young people and social media, even people in the world are recognizing that it's causing a serious problem. And they're by no means Christians or members of the church or trying to advocate for the Bible or anything. They just realize out of common sense, we've got some serious problems going on with social media and young people. So number one, we've got to remove any negative, worldly, or hurtful thinking from our life. Number two, this is what I call the replacement principle. Turn with me to chapter 11 of the book of Luke and verse 26. After we get things out of our life, we've got to make sure that we fill that empty room, that void, with what is good. This is what I call the replacement principle. So it's not just a matter of uh, don't do this and don't do that, but we've got to refill it with that which is good. And so here's where your uh, good works and prayer and reading the Bible more. And I, I love to talk to the young boys this morning. They were showing me the list of all of their duties, uh, you know, putting up the song numbers and all that kind of thing. I thought that was really neat. We've got to fill our lives with that which is good. So Jesus talks about it's actually a lesson toward these Pharisees who were not filling their lives with good. But he says in verse 24, the unclean spirit, when he has gone out of the man, passes through waterless places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will turn back into my house whence I came. And when he has come, he findeth it swept and garnished. So it's just a clean, a clean house. It's all ready to go. And he goeth in and he taketh seven other spirits more evil than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man has become worse than the first. So after getting rid of the negative and the worldly and the hurtful, we've got to replace that with the good. And that's what our lesson was this morning. God's word and prayer and being here in the assembly. And we're even going to talk Tuesday night, Lord willing, about having a happy, enjoying life. There's a lot of sadness in the world today. But enjoying life and have a happy life and some things that we can do to be happier. We've got to replace the evil with the good. Number three, we need to practice spiritual disciplines. Jesus learned obedience. The word learned there does not mean book knowledge. He didn't go to the library there in Capernaum and check out a book on obedience and open it up. How do I obey my father? The word learned there means to learn by practice, to learn by doing. He, he led a life of practice in serving his father. I'm going to list to you this evening, if you're taking some notes, I just simply went through the life of Christ briefly and took note of things that he did on a daily basis that made him the godly individual that he was. And he did those things to be an example for us. And so let me encourage you that if we find ourselves as adults or our young people, if they're having mental problems or struggles, first of all, try to assess what is it that's coming into their heart that is going out with this negativity. And then once we remove that, let's replace that with that which is good. Now, when I read this list, <laughs> I realize that, you know, you're probably not going to hear this out in the world. I realize that. <laughs> but we've got to get back to these things. Number one, Jesus was always praying by himself. He would go out by himself and pray. Sometimes it was private. One time the text says he went up into a mountain to pray by himself. Sometimes it was private. Sometimes it was with others. Number two, singing. Um, when they finished the, uh, the Passover meal and the institution of the Lord's Supper, it said that they sang a hymn and then went out. He sang with his apostles. Fasting. We don't do that much in our society, but skipping a meal to concentrate on, on changing something in my uh, mind or my, my heart to focus on that. 
He did that before being tempted. Rest. In, in the book of Mark, we're told that he went out with his apostles and he said, let's go out and rest for a while. They had been very busy. A period of silence and solitude. We're so fast paced in this world today. Bang, 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 bang. All these things. Can we take some things off of our plate to have more time for rest? Number five, simplicity. Did Jesus own a house? Did he have a house? I'm not saying give up your house, but Jesus did not have a lot of material things, did he? And I'm hearing now that there are some younger people in our culture today that are actually trying to get back to uh, what's called minimalism, just, just simple things inside their house, maybe one chair or just a few little things. There are some people that are actually trying to get back to just having simplistic things. In their, in their life. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Number six, scripture reading. He, he would quote scripture. He would read from scripture. He had it memorized. A lot of times he would just simply quote it to individuals. Number seven, he went to the synagogue to worship. Don't ever underestimate the value of being here for corporate together worship. Number eight, he was always talking about being submissive to his father. I'm going to get up each day. I'm going to be submissive to my heavenly father. That goes a long way in uh, controlling our actions. Number nine, and this is what we need to get back to in our society, serving others. Serving others. He was always out serving others, always out doing good, always showing compassion, always trying to help someone. We live in a very selfish world. And young people, please do not grow up and be selfish. Be givers. Go out, and, go out and help somebody. Help your mom and dad. Help grandma and grandpa. Help, help your neighbor. Be a giver. Be a helper. But he was always serving others. Number 10, he was welcoming and working with all people, including outcasts. He would eat with them. He would talk with, with uh, the lepers and the women who were outcast, and the publicans and the harlots. Just, just be a people person and talk with other people and welcome them and share the gospel with them and tell them about being a Christian. Number 11, he was always telling others about his father and his mission. I'm here to seek and to save the lost. I'm here to do my father's will. I'm here to try to get people to go to heaven. Be someone who... who, who Tells people about being a Christian and about going to heaven. Number 12, he was always fellowshipping with other godly individuals, particularly the apostles. Pick out other Christians, other young Christians to be with. Some of you were at a camp this past week and there were some other young Christians there that you can be with. Fellowshipping with other young people, with other people your age, with people that are like-minded, that helps us. And then last of all, he was very disciplined in his work of preaching and teaching the kingdom of heaven, being disciplined in work. So again, you go down through that and you see, wow, that would really help my mind. My mind and my thinking would change a lot if every day was about praying and singing and fasting and resting and simplicity and scripture and all of these things. My life would change dramatically. And we're thinking, well, wait a minute. I would have to cut some things out. Yeah, I'm probably going to have to cut some things out. And we can find some areas of our life, including the phone, to cut out. One other thing on the phone before I move on. And again, we've got to be thinking godly, uh, godly thoughts. Um, I use my phone all the time. And I love it. Um, Sherry will tell you, well, he's always checking the weather. And uh, my dad used to check the weather. Thank you. And um, I'm always checking the weather. Look, again, the caveat. We're not saying don't ever use your phone or don't spend time on your phone. You, might, you may need that for work. I like to check the weather. I like to, I've been using it, I'll be using it this week to get to different places in town that I don't know well. Just put it in Google Maps. Um, Again, good uses for Facebook, checking family and friends and things like that. What we're talking about is this. We're talking about using a phone to get my guidance in life. That, that's the problem. We're not talking about checking the weather. 
We're not ch talking about checking restaurant reviews. I like to check the restaurant reviews before I go to a restaurant. We're, we're talking about using our phone to get guidance in life. I don't use my phone for guidance. I don't use my phone to have someone tell me how to act, what, what kind of character to have. I don't use it for that. And I don't use my phone to find out if, if, I, if my mind is not right and I'm not feeling right. Well, I'm just going to look up on Google how, how to live. I don't use it for that. I don't use it for guidance. I don't use it how to live. And I don't use it for relationships. Warm body people. In this um, Surgeon General report, the Surgeon General report is saying that our young people are having mental problems because they're trying to live their life by building relationships on their phone and not with actually warm-blooded human individuals. The report says that, not me. They're becoming more isolated. They're becoming more depressed. And here's what's happening. The phone is telling them if their body looks good or not. The phone is telling them if their clothes are right or not, or their language is right or not. And that's how they're building their lives. If we're talking about the weather and directions and you're using it for work, that's completely different. If we're talking about, I've got to read this in order to find out how to live or to be a person, that's what the problem is. And that's what I'm talking about this evening. We've got to get that kind of thing out of our life. And think more godly thoughts. Turn with me to Philippians 4 and verse 8. Very well-known passage. God will help us to think about what is honorable. That means reverent and respected. Some of the, tick, the very few TikTok videos that I've seen were not actually on TikTok. It's reports about that. But it's the opposite of honorable. It's dishonorable. It's young men and young women dressing provocatively, acting provocatively. It's not honorable. It's not reverend and respectful. Things that are just and fair, things that are pure, things that are lovely, whatever is of a good report. If there be any virtue, that means character. If there's any praise, think on these things. And when we're thinking on those kind of things, I will not have actions coming out in my, my life that are bad. I've got to be minding the things of God, not the things of men. You are what you think. Well, as we close this evening again, let me encourage you to begin and end your day with prayer. In Mark 1.35, the text says, A great while before day. You underscore that. A great while before day. Jesus went off and entered into prayer. Begin with God. Begin and end your day with God. The righteous man meditates on the law of God day and night. Be thinking about that throughout the day. Parents, you can talk with your children on the way home after the morning service in the car. You can talk with them about Jesse's lesson. Jesse preached on such and such. What, what do you all think about that? Don't let the sermon be the end of, of, of the thought. That can be throughout the rest of the day and even throughout the rest of the week. And what we study on Wednesday night can give us something to think about on Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Don't let it be a one-off where it's just contained to the building but we're talking about it and we're thinking about it and we're discussing it all throughout the week, that might mean that we have to change some behavior and some scheduling and how we do some things. But as parents, we can do that. And as young people, we can do that. We've got to be thinking more godly thoughts and then we'll be having more godly actions. Input, output. It's not that difficult. And we've got to learn to react properly to things that are around us. Say a prayer right when you get up and right before you go to sleep. Read a little bit of God's word right when you get up and right before you go to sleep. Meditate it on, on it throughout the day. And one last thing, and again, I'm trying to be uh, practical here. 
But our brain, which is the connecting point with our mind and our heart and our spirit and soul and our body, our brain is an organ. It's an organ, just like kidneys. Kidneys are an organ. Uh, your liver is an organ. Your heart is an organ. Do you know your brain is an organ? It's a physical organ of the body. You have to keep it healthy just like you have to keep your kidneys healthy and your liver and your heart. Good diet and exercise. I'm going to say some more about this Tuesday night with regard to feeling better. There is a lot of discussion in this country about childhood obesity and other kinds of things going on. People are realizing that our physical diet and our physical bodies, whether we're active or not, has a lot to do with our mind and our mental health. As much as possible, stay healthy. I'm going to say some more about this Tuesday night. Sherry and I have been trying to diet and exercise over the past year and a half. And when, when I'm middle-aged, and I'm just speaking for myself, when you're young, like Jesse Flowers, you don't have to worry about this. But when you get middle-aged and the middle-aged spread comes on, guys, you know what that is. And I, I've got to work at it. But I want to be around for my wife and my children and, and to serve God. But just like our kidney is an organ and our pancreas is an organ and our brain is an organ, we've got to take care of those things. And we've got to put things in our body that are going to be good for all of our organs. And I don't like to give up stuff. Last fall, I had a full blood work panel done, and my doctor said, your cholesterol is a little too high. It's like 210. I need to get it down. I don't want to give up my bacon, but I have. I love the taste of bacon. I could eat a whole pound of bacon, but I've given it up for some turkey products that don't taste as good but are better for me. If we have to change something in our diet to stay more healthy, if we need to exercise, if we need to get out and keep ourselves healthy, that is very important to having a healthy mind as well. So as we close this evening, we're going to sing this song of encouragement, Is Thy Heart Right With God? You have to guard your heart. And young people and old alike, you have to guard your heart. Listen, no one else can do it for you. And when you're real little, your parents are helping you to grow up and be your own young man and your own young lady. And we've got several of them here this evening. And I want to commend our parents who are here. You're trying to raise your children to be young Christians, and what a great thing that is. I've been encouraged by our parents. And it's a difficult thing to do, but you're doing a great job. And I see our, some of our young Christians here, and I pray that the other young ones here this evening will grow up and be young Christians as well. But your parents are trying to help you to guard your heart. One day, you've got to stand on your own. And you're going to have to get out there on your own, and no one else can guard it for you. And I hope that we've learned this evening a little bit how to do that. Getting the evil out, replacing it with the good, thinking on godly things. Because, the proverb writer says, out of our heart is going to come all of that action. And we want that action to be pleasing to God. So my question as we close this evening is this. Are your heart defenses strong or weak? Are your heart defenses strong or weak? Let's work on having a defense, a wall around our heart that is guarded and kept only for God and His service. The way to have a healthy mind is to be a Christian, first and foremost. If you need to come and put on Christ in baptism, I would encourage you to do that. I'm going to close this way every time, if I can remember. You need to become a Christian, or as an erring child of God, let me encourage you to come back. That will be the best thing you can do starting tonight, and then if there are other things... We need to work on, there's godly brethren here that will help you to work on those things, but become a Christian or come back to the Lord. Start right there. And then you will have that heart that is opened up to 
God and his word and all of the great things that he can do for you. Is your heart right with God? When it's cleansed from sin, it is. And when it's for God's service and holiness, it is. Let us help you to have that right heart this evening. Why won't you come as we stand and as we sing?